So our next presenter uh, is presenting three talks today. Uh, this is her first. Uh, is a programmer who works for the Bureau of Meteorology on the Next Generation Weather Forecasting System. Uh, please welcome Brianna Lauer. Uh, hi everyone, and thanks for coming to my talk, or at least remaining motionless in your seat while talks continue around you. Um, I, I work at the research department of the Bureau of Meteorology, which is called CORCA. It's a climate and weather something research. Um, and as Chris mentioned, I work on a project which is called the Next Generation Forecast and Warning System, I think. And uh, a component of that is the automatic generation of text forecasts. So when you open the newspaper and it says cloudy, uh, chance of rain, clearing by the evening, that text is generally generated by the program that I work on, which is called the Graphical Forecast Editor. And so this talk is a little bit, might be a little bit strange for this stream, uh, and I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about the programming language which we use, which is Python, um, but it's, this talk is actually more focused on how you can use really simple features which are available in you know, any of the languages that will be mentioned in this stream to explicitly program language, and by language I mean uh, English language rather than some kind of meta computer language. So a lot of people, you know, if you're working on a program, it's more than likely that you'll have to uh, output some uh, information, which may well be in text or in language. Uh, so you have to display some information to your user. And if you can just display canned information, uh, then strings are awesome, and you can just have as many strings as you like. Uh, you know, that's not even getting into translation of strings or internationalization. Uh, but if you need to have a little uh, context sensitivity, or you want something that's not quite so canned, then you might need to do something that might look a little bit like generation, text generation. So uh, natural language generation or text generation generally refers to when you're using some input which is not language to start with, and you're going to produce some language output or some textual output. So you might be summarizing some statistics, you might be summarizing an appointment or uh, an invitation or something like that. Um, but if you if you if you work with strings and you kind of go to strings too early and then you find that you need to modify your strings, uh, it can be a real pain. So this is about what can you do uh, in the middle layer in terms of encoding some representation of language that is going to give you a bit more flexibility before you finally output your strings. Uh, okay. It says AV system will turn off in 15 minutes, but I'm going to ignore that. Uh, so the program that I work on is called the Graphical Forecast Editor, and this is used by uh, forecasters in uh, currently in Victoria and New South Wales, and it's being rolled out to TAS in South Australia this year, and uh, the, uh, the other states uh, next year. So this is what they use when they're sitting in their office forecasting. Uh, and there's a bunch of grids on the side here, so they have some names like wind. T, which is temperature, max T, min T, sky, and then the one that's highlighted down here is pop, which is probability of precipitation. And then this is the, this is the gridded uh, output. And I think this has got some wind, wind barbs overlaid on top of it. So the, the gray area is kind of saying pops probably below, I think that's maybe 10 or 5%. Um, so probably not going to get any precipitation there, going up to the dark blue, purple colour, where that might be 40%. So there's a reasonable chance of precipitation in that area. And so these uh, grids come in from numer uh, numerical weather prediction models, and uh, forecasters kind of play with these grids and tweak them and modify them until they're happy with them. Uh, and then they press uh, one of these buttons up the top, and the text is automatically generated from these grids. So they're not handwriting the forecasts, although they can edit them if they don't like the text. So this is a little bit of a graph of what the forecast process is. 
So the numerical weather prediction models and observations come in, and you have these grids which we just saw before. Uh, and then uh, smart tools are used, and these are supposed to represent kind of meteorological or scientific processes produce this weather grid. And uh, what I'm concentrating on is just the text generation for the weather phrase. Um, and then from this we have statistics, and then the text formatters, which is the text generation, basically want to simplify the statistics and then produce some words, and that becomes the text forecast that we get in the paper or on the website. Um, and so we saw with this grid, we talk about uh, gridded forecasts, and there's some forecasts which are for areas and some which are for points. But even though it's a point, it's still like three or six k's across. And so there's some interesting problems in terms of calculating uh, coverage which when you have this point, which is kind of a point but not really, and then you want to extrapolate to a larger area as well. And so when uh, we talk about whether in this context, it's actually kind of a subset of what you might think of as weather, which is what's going to be uh, forecast for. So the cloud, if you know, sunny or cloudy, that's not weather. If it's windy, that's not weather. If it's going to be hot, that's not weather. But all these things. So if it's going to rain, anything related to rain, thunderstorms, fog, frost, these other things, that's what we consider weather. And so in this uh, weather grid, which is uh, created from the, like the pop grid, probability of precipitation, um, we have about, I think there's 15 different types of weather and we have these keys. So they've each got these uh, four components which is coverage, type, intensity, and then these optional attributes. Uh, so there's optional and multiple attributes. So attributes um, can be things like hail and flash flooding. Down on the bottom one, we have these uh, thunderstorms. Um, but often, you know, there's no attributes, but you do have to have the coverage, intensity, and type. So this is some example of keys and how they would be represented uh, in text. And we can see that there's a pretty decent uh, correspondence between, uh, basically, if we, if we wanted to convert the key to the words, we'd basically say the coverage words come first, then the intensity words, and then the type words, and then last of all we have the attribute words. So as a first pass, that seems like a fairly decent model for how we're going to convert these keys into words. Um, and just with coverage, there's there's a lot of terms, there's basically four different levels of coverage which represent, you know, I think wide is like 55 plus, so more than 55% chance of rain. Um, and ISOL patchy is like 0 to 30, scattered areas is like 30 to 55, I think that's about right. And so depending on the type that we're combining it with and depending on the type of forecast, so if it's for a point or an area, um, these are some of the terms <coughs> on the right that we we'll use to correspond to these in our weather keys. So a reason that we don't just say scattered all the time is because if you're forecasting for what's supposed to be a point, it doesn't really make sense to say scattered, like there's either showers or there's not. Um, so we say at times, and that's kind of hedging our bets. Um, so we, ha we have all these keys, so maybe we could just list every possible combination and, and just, you know, have a massive table and list them all. Um, but there's kind of too many, so maybe that's not the best idea. So we need to do a little bit of generation. And so what the old infrastructure did, so this uh, graphical forecast editor is something that Australia uh, inherited or borrowed from the US, and their uh, forecast texts are much simpler when it comes to forecasting weather. So they would just pretty much just say showers or rain. Um, they wouldn't have this at times or easing to light drizzle, or uh, they wouldn't have a lot of elements that we use. Uh, so we have, the old system had, which we inherited, had a lot of these kind of lookup tables. Uh, and this would look a not, lot nicer in Prolog, but um, not many people use Prolog. Uh, so what this is saying is if, if, you, if your key has this coverage term and matches this type and this intensity, use this, use this string on the end. And then 
uh, there'd also be this part order list. And so this would say if your key has this coverage, this type, this intensity, put everything in this order. And so if we look at this bottom one, this is kind of the default one. So we can see it's got prefix, okay, let's ignore that, coverage, intensity, type, attributes. That's basically what we said before when we looked at the four examples. And uh, it's also got this TD, which is the time descriptor, so in the morning. And as SN, which is as snow, and that's, we won't worry about that either. So if we look at a particular example, um, which is if we had isolated showers for a point forecast, so we're using this point, the name of the function is point weather coverage, so we're looking up for a point. Um, what we say is a shower or two. And so this is getting the coverage component of that is going to be the or two. And the prefix is actually going to be the A. But they're, I mean, they kind of go together. It's like a shower or two. It should be one thing, but they're actually separated in this infrastructure. And so then we see here that we have intensity prefix intensity type coverage. And so the fact that the coverage comes after the type in this list is how we get the shower or two happening in the right order as opposed to saying or two showers, which would not be grammatical. Um, so that's our basic thing. Our basic thing was coverage intensity type attributes. But there's lots of uh, you know, exceptions. So in the first case, if we have thunderstorms with hail and flash flooding, uh, we don't want to say like with hail, with flash flooding. We want to be able to combine the hail and flash flooding so we don't repeat the preposition. Uh, with this isolated thunderstorms, possibly severe. This is such a pain. This is an adjective, possibly severe, but because it's kind of wordy, we want to push it out to the end and add this comma. It's a total nightmare. We've got these showers at times, uh, and at times is also used as a time descriptor when something happens intermittently. So it actually has this double meaning, which apparently, you know, doesn't seem to matter. We've got a shower or two. We've got dry thunderstorms, and dry is actually an attribute. But you, don't, you wouldn't say thunderstorms with dry. So we need to recognise that dry is an adjective, and it's going to go in this different spot compared to the other uh, attributes, which are preposition phrases. Then we've got this very hazy. This isn't even a noun phrase, unlike everything else. This is an adjective phrase. Um, don't know why they decided to do that. We've got patchy morning fog, where instead of the time phrase being a preposition phrase, like in the morning, uh, we actually use it as an adjective. And so then it's got to slot in with the other adjectives so you have the right order there. So like the adjective ordering thing is, is a little bit subtle, but there's definite... Uh, preferred ways, and then there's a whole lot of vague ways as well. So uh, morning patchy fog versus patchy morning fog, um, you know, which sounds better? I think patchy morning fog is slightly better, but it's very hard to, to say why, and this is part of this, this is like this adjective ordering thing which speakers of English learn, but it's very hard to explicitly say what the rules are. Um, and then we have showers falling in snow, which I'm not really going to talk about because that's big pain as well. Uh, and there's also this thing called co-reportability. And it's not really a language restriction. Well, it may be we could consider it a language restriction, but we could get just consider it a constraint that's coming from the kind of meteorological basis to what we're doing. So the forecast is really like if you had thunderstorms and showers, they want them to be in the same sentence. So they want you to say showers and thunderstorms. Because in their head, you know, they're associated, they're related meteorological things. And so it gives them great satisfaction to see them in the same sentence. Whereas if you had showers, full stop, thunderstorms, it would just rub them all the wrong way and they would rewrite it. So we have to put showers and thunderstorms together. But if you had showers and fog at the same time, they don't consider those meteorologically related. So if you wrote showers and fog, they would change it to be showers, full stop, fog. Um, so pretty much precipitation and thunderstorms need to go together, frost and fog need to go together, and everything else pretty much just has its own sentence. So this is not a syntactic restriction. There's nothing, uh, we're not breaking any rules of grammar if we say showers and fog. Um, you know, that's totally valid. And actually, you know, for lay people who don't know meteorology, they wouldn't consider there's anything wrong with it either. Um, but the, meteorolo the forecasters, meteorologists, you know, have this extra level of knowledge, and for them, 
it's almost ungrammatical. And so maybe we consider it a semantic restriction or it's just some other type of restriction that we have on our system. So that's looking at um, single blocks of weather which aren't changing. But then we also have this idea of trends where we have some weather and it's changing and becoming some other weather. And if we just have you know, uh, heavy rain easing to light drizzle, that's quite simple. You, know, you just list everything, you just list your connector, then you list everything again. But if you want to be a little bit smarter and have some kind of context sensitive rendering of your sentence, then you want to avoid uh, repeating things that you've already said and you want to um, uh, have some contextual rendering. So in this middle example, we have chance of showers becoming scattered showers. So scattered is a greater coverage term than chance. So we, instead of saying, we could say becoming scattered, but becoming more likely is a comparative term. And that's kind of nicer. That's more, you know, closer to what a human is going to do. So if we look at the old system in terms of how it modelled uh, a noun phrase, so just going back to one block of weather, it was something like this. It was just super flat and then, you know, this was your default and then you had lots of exceptions to override the defaults. And equally, if we look at what you might uh, do if you were analysing it in an um, English class, you'd have this really complex thing and so you've got like a noun phrase at that level and a noun phrase up at that level and, you know, recursive adjective phrases over here. So, scattered, very dangerous, thunderstorms with hail and flash flooding. That's not even getting into flash flooding. But, um, well, you know, that's a little bit complex for what we're doing because we're not modelling all of English and we don't want to model all of English because it's overkill and it's going to be too complex. So we want to pick something that's in the middle that has enough expressiveness for what we're actually doing but is not, uh, is not biting off more than we can chew. So we're going to make something a little bit flatter and, you know, at certain levels we're going to flatten things out. So, natural language generation often has a model kind of similar to this, where your input goal is your statistics, your text planning is deciding, okay, what am I actually going to say? Because normally you have to leave things out or simplify them or, you know, use some comparative forms. And then the linguistic realisation is actually coming out to your string. Um, and so, in rewriting this infrastructure, the thing that was uh, the most striking thing to me is that the text planning you can do or the simplification that you can do is like entirely dependent on what you are able to realise. So what kinds of things you are able to say. Uh, that just drives everything. So the, this presentation of them as separate stages is you know, quite misleading because they're very intertwined. So we want to use the rules of English um, a little bit but not too much. And we want to avoid recursion because it's just scary. It's not scary, but it's hard. So we want to keep it simple and flat. And so the first thing that we notice about forecast English, forecast English, let's say it's a subset of the entire expressiveness of, of English, is that it's really focused on noun phrases. And things that are grammatical in forecast English are not grammatical in regular English. So you can't just say rain. You can say it is raining, it will rain, it rained. But you can't just say rain. But in forecast English, that's a totally fine thing to say. And they, you know, in English when you say like, it is raining, you go, well, what is it? It's actually like a dummy subject. Um, and we only put it there because English requires... Yeah. <laughs> Am I back? No? So, forecast English. Um, so, this is the kind of um, data structures that we ended up using. So, it's quite simple. We're not going to use recursion. We have this thing called a conjoined noun phrase, um, which is not you know, a part of speech in English, but we're going to use that. And it's quite simple. We've just got lists of stuff, and then we've got a dictionary mapping from part of speech to some words. And we use the, the part of speech to control where things appear. 
in what order things appear. Um, yeah, conjoined noun phrases. So uh, this is like this is the part of speech ordering for our noun phrase, um, and you can see that we've got this time prep phrase, snow height prep phrase, and prep phrase, which represents the last one represents the attributes. Now they're all uh, preposition phrases, um, but we need a way to control where they appear in the sentence, the different types of prep phrases, and so. We use part of speech to control this because normally, uh, you know, prep phrases have multiple places they can appear, but that kind of makes it too hard, uh, or it makes it more complicated. Whereas if we create these uh, fake parts of speech, I mean, they're not fake; they they exist for our purposes in our limited language domain. So we use these to control in what order things appear. So you'll always have. Uh, the snow height prep phrase is like 100, uh, above 1,500 metres and the time prep phrase is like in the morning. So you'll always have in the morning above 1,500 metres. You'll never have it the other way around because of this ordering. And I'm going to go through this because my time is running out. Um, so one of the things that we need to worry about with the conjoined prep phrases where we might have uh, fog and frost uh, is we don't, you don't want to repeat things. So if you have patchy frog and patchy frost, you want to say patchy fog and frost. You don't want to repeat the patchy. Um, but depending on uh, the type of forecast and the specification for the particular type, uh, you might actually be using different words. So it's not quite enough to just say, you know, if you said patchy before, don't say it now, because you might have said patches of fog you don't want to say patches of fog and patchy frost. It's still repetitive. So you need to um, account for synonyms, even though they might be in different parts of speech. And the fog patches is like a particularly nasty one because normally uh, the type is the head of the noun phrase. So fog is the head. But when you say fog patches, then the head of it is actually uh, patches or patch. And so you need to somehow rip that out again and make fog the head again. Uh, and the, as I was saying, these prep phrases are really annoying. Um, and this is kind of this well-known uh, ambiguity problem, which is if you have two prep phrases, uh, it won't be clear which one, or it may not be clear which one the second one applies to. Because you've got your head noun, which is going to be showers, and then you've got a noun in the first prep phrase, which is morning in the first example. And then uh, does the hail is the hail, with hail, is that applying to the morning or is that applying to the showers? Uh, and in the first example, um, it doesn't matter because morning is not something that comes with hail. Showers is something that comes with hail. So the reader can use the semantics or the meaning of these words to deduce that there's only one logical meaning. So this is like the joke, you know, um, uh, I shot an elephant in my pyjamas, how he got my pyjamas I'll never know. And so in my pyjamas can apply to I or the elephant, just to totally deconstruct that joke for you. Um, so this is the same problem. Uh, and then showers with hail in the morning, it's not clear if the in the morning is limiting the hail or the showers. So did the showers go all day and the hail was just in the morning, or did the showers and hail, were they both just in the morning? Uh, and so it, it matters a little bit, but maybe not a huge amount. And then we also have a, a location prep phrase for uh, types of sentences called local effects. So if we have a large area, but something is just happening in part of the area, then we want to use another uh, preposition phrase to say to limit the location of it. Uh, so rewriting this, um, you know, we were motivated to do this by um, uh, the difficulty with the old system in terms of the logic for controlling the word order being distributed among 12 or more different functions and just being quite afraid to change anything um, in terms of being unsure what the repercussions of it would be. So with this system it's like quite uh, you know localized, it's in one place and the, the logic of the English or the language is not mixed in with the logic of choosing what you want to say which is the document text planning. So, um, like creating this 
kind of simple infrastructure is pretty simple because you know we weren't trying to model all of English. We're just trying to model what we had to. But um, integrating it with our other stuff proved to be not quite so simple. Um, so I think it's something that uh, is worth considering if you are dealing with a system that uh, has a lot of uh, output and you need to be a little bit context sensitive or you find you're doing a lot of string mani manipulation uh, and it's quite painful, maybe you need to consider encoding some English explicitly somewhere in your system. Thank you. Right. Um, everyone, thank you. Anna, for so while our presenters are changing over, we'll take some questions. Uh, if you please wait till the microphone shows up somewhere near you before uh, you say anything. Any questions? Yep. Uh, thanks for the exercise. Anything like me at all, if you do. How long have you actually been running this uh, Python? I think you said it. Well, how long have you been ru actually running this now? The whole system. Yeah. Uh, uh, the whole system started in being used in Victoria in 2006, I think, and just rolled out to New South Wales uh, September last year. And the US has been using it for you know years longer than that. Uh, for Queensland, their rollout is not going to happen this year, but I think next year or the year after. And so one of the, one of the good side effects of it is that you will get a lot more you will get a lot more forecasts. So for a lot more points and for a lot more days, you'll have a lot more towns that have seven day forecasts. Like that's quite a normal thing in Victoria and New South Wales now. Whereas up here, towns will only have one or two day forecasts um, because they don't have to write each one manually; they're just automatically generated. Hey, any other questions? Yep. You, then you. Would you say the forecasts um, uh, So we, we monitor when they get edited, and the rates vary from around 10% for the really short forecast, which is called a pricey, up to about 50% for the coastal waters forecast, which is uh, focuses on wind and we don't do the wind phrase very well. Um, but there's a lot to be untangled in terms of is the problem the statistics that we got in the first place? Is it how we simplified them? Uh, are they just being picky and it's kind of a, a, what do you call it? It's not really a necessary change or is it like a big mistake? Um, so we're monitoring the changes that they make and trying to you know, figure out is it something we can fix and to reduce the editing rates, because it's obviously, you know, if they have to edit it, it it's a big workload for them. Just wondering, with your new system, how long have you gone so far without any grammatical errors whatsoever? Well, it's kind of, I think it is hard for it to make grammatical errors, actually, because, uh, just because of the way it's built. Um, um, yeah, it, ha it actually, th this new system hasn't gone live in the uh, regions yet. It's going out late January. So um, if I get a firestorm of complaints in February, I'll know that I'll need to do some work. But, uh, you know, we've had it running on a review server for quite a few weeks now and given it a fair bit of testing and it looks pretty good. Well... <laughs> I mean, to go back to like the weather, the weather grid, you know, with the weather keys, it's like quite spelled out for you. You don't have to do that much interpretation in terms of how it should be said. So it's pretty straightforward. It should be something we can get right, and we're getting a lot closer, I think. Right. So uh, this has been a, a, a talk that's on something that probably not many of the people in the uh, the audience have considered would, would have considered before. Um, so thank you very much for. Um, for making us aware of it. Thank you, Chris. Okay, since we're um, we're running a tad late, um, we'll just wait for our next presenter to get his uh, yeah as close as possible.